Nom Nom delivers fresh food with whole ingredients, backed by veterinarian science. Science tells us that a dog's health starts in the bowl, so improving their diet is one of the best ways to help them live a long and happy life. Nom Nom's food is full of proteins your dog loves and the vitamins and nutrients they need to thrive. All you have to do is order, pour, and serve. Ready to make the switch to fresh? Order Nom Nom today. Go to https colon slash slash trinom.com forward slash curveball and get 50% off your first order plus free shipping. That's https colon slash slash T-R-Y-N-O-M dot com forward slash curveball. Plus, Nom Nom comes with a money back guarantee. If your dog's tail isn't wagging within 30 days, Nom Nom will refund your first order. No fillers, no nonsense, just Nom Nom. Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. achieve, achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by Marco Kasich. Marco is the founder and executive director of Fun Life. Fun Life is based in the Philippines. It is an organization that uses experiential learning and purposeful play to enable pathways for young people and children in short-term and chronic emergencies. So we're going to be talking to him about his organization and his story and everything that he's up to and how we can help maybe somebody out there that's listening that needs this organization. So Marco, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure, Curtis. Thank you so much for having me. Why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Sure. So, um, as you said, my name is Marco Kasich, or in a previous life, Malko Kasich. I was born in uh, Croatia, and my family moved to the UK when I was six um, due to some um, internal conflict in former Yugoslavia. And, uh, yeah, I had a pretty happy uh, childhood growing up in London, uh, however, I always felt there was an itch I couldn't quite scratch working in a traditional corporate job. So when I graduated university and, and spent about a year in, in corporate finance, I just had this sort of um, desire to do something different. And I had no idea what that different would look like or where it would take me. But uh, it was enough to to make me leave the UK, quit my job and just travel and, and somehow ended up in the in the Philippines. Never heard of the Philippines beyond obviously uh, some famous people that, that originated from there, but ended up here. And really, that was the start of my uh, journey with Fund Life. It, it really transformed the way I saw uh, purposeful living, the way I, I realized we could bring value to others through our work. And it really taught me for the first time that there was another way to live life uh, beyond the traditional nine to five corporate rat race that I had grown up in the UK and that so many of my friends had gone down the path of. So that's really, I would say, that the background to, to fund life. And yeah, happy to share a little bit more throughout the conversation. Absolutely. Well, you're also a runner and a former po- poker player, so... Before we jump into fun life, tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, so like like I said, I just felt that um, when I graduated and I was trying to find my place in the world, I didn't resonate with working for somebody else for a cause I didn't believe in. So I was looking at you know alternative options, and I came across poker, which I was surprisingly good at. Uh, I, I found my niche there, and and for about three to four months. I was actually uh, earning quite a lot of money, um, disciplining myself to, to to play regularly and 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 using sort of certain 
tactics. Uh, and yeah, that, that worked out well. But I, again, I just had this sense of I was making money, but I wasn't entirely happy in the way I was doing it, um, especially in poker, because when I would win in poker, it meant other people lost. And it was very transactional. And I felt that um, in business also, it was like that, that for businesses to do well, in most cases, somebody had to do badly, uh, especially in corporate finance, because I graduated just on the back of the global financial meltdown. So, um, so yeah, uh, and then poker lasted about six months. And then I realized it wasn't for me. I, I retired after six months after I saved up a bit of money. Uh, and running is something that I started doing actually at the start of this year. So since January 1, I committed to running uh, every day. It's It's non-negotiable. And so at some point today, I will run my 213th day consecutively. And uh, yeah, just something that has been pretty um pretty powerful for me in terms of uh mental health more than the physical health of, of running which comes so yeah that's something that is uh, very important now and, and makes up a, a daily part of my routine so tell us about fun life T tell us what your organization does and why you decided to get it started uh, fund life really started by by accident. So I mentioned that when I when I left the UK, I was a little bit lost in terms of where I wanted to go. But I met a Canadian guy who was setting up a a business in the Philippines, and we just sort of resonated uh, with with what he was doing. So I joined him to lead his business development, um, and I arrived in the Philippines very very green, very naive. Um, and what I was struck by was just the extreme poverty that, that was living side by side next to extreme wealth. So Manila, the capital, is, is, is a metropolis of about 20 million people. It's very densely populated. So it's quite common to go from a five-star hotel or very exclusive luxury mall and literally on the doorstep would be a slum. And so this sort of struck me uh, quite profoundly because I, I came from Europe where I was quite sheltered from this extreme inequality and, and poverty. And so I started volunteering through sports. I, I played soccer as a, as, a, as, a, as a child growing up. And I found this organization that was working in the slums of Manila, empowering and providing opportunity and scholarships to children through soccer. And so I started volunteering, and that was really the the the, the start of Fund Life. Through that, I, I noticed how powerful sport is at actually giving identity and giving hope to marginalized groups. And so Fund Life is really an extension of that. Um, that was about ten years ago. And so when I started that journey, we really tried to create a structured organization where we can build educational content, where we can work with children through schools, through communities, to really change their life and change their mindset through empowering them using sport as a tool, whether it's football or, or soccer or volleyball, um, and now running. So basically, it's really just connecting with vulnerable young people who often feel marginalized and then really investing them through mentorship and through sports training that hopefully will help them um, find their own passion. It doesn't have to be sport, but it's really connecting them with this idea that they can be whoever they want to be as long as they commit themselves to whatever their passion is. So what, what all that your organization does positively what got you blacklisted from the UN Humanitarian Summit? It seemed like they would want, <laughs> seemed like they would want somebody like you and your organization. <laughs> yeah, um, it's an interesting story. Uh, essentially, um, they organized so 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 for context. The United Nations organized the global uh, summit called World Humanitarian Summit, and. The idea was to bring uh, leading figures around the world and leading organizations around the world to discuss how to tackle the global refugee crisis, which was 
this was 2016, so it was it was a pandemic at that time uh, in terms of the number of refugees being displaced. Um, but part of it was part of that summit was that they would give sponsorship to organizations all around the world who couldn't travel because the the, the summit was in Turkey. So if they were inviting an organization from Southeast Asia like Fund Life or from Africa or from South America, the cost to attend would be far too high for most small grassroots organizations. So um, essentially they set up a sponsorship uh, package for these organizations and uh, there was about 20 organizations that I knew that had applied maybe six months before and the UN simply didn't respond. So you had 20 or 30 organizations that I knew of at least that were essentially waiting to hear if they could attend. And even if they weren't selected to get sponsored, they weren't informed. So essentially they had two or three weeks to sort out their flights if they wanted to go. And and I just sort of wasn't particularly happy with the way that UN were treating these organizations, not really understanding the challenges they had because finding travel fare for that kind of journey is, is very problematic. Um, and eventually we, we got a response from them after I went to the very top of the organization and somebody wasn't very happy that I had uh, superseded their position, let's say. Um, and so when I arrived, they uh, told me in no unceremonious terms that uh, I'm blacklisted and then I was escorted by security out. Um, so yeah, it was an interesting uh, journey to Turkey, uh, fortunately. <laughs> After a couple of phone calls and a couple of hours later, I was allowed to enter. So, um, yeah, interesting, interesting story. Most definitely. Another interesting story about you is you, you contributed for the Huff Post. So t- tell us about that and tell us what you did for the Huff Post. Uh, yeah, when I was in the UK and, and when I was sort of embarking on this social impact journey, I was actually, I, I met the editor of, of the Huffington Post uh, for the UK and we just had a chat over coffee and, and she essentially invited me to contribute some of my thoughts on, on business, on society, almost like a social commentary. So for about, I think, six or seven months, I was writing uh, a personal blog on uh, for, for the Huffington Post. And then uh, I think I realized that I, I became to, I, I sort of grew to realize that actions speak louder so so that has been sort of my mantra after after i finished with that i realized that words are powerful but but actions are 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 essentially loudest and and so that stint lasted again about six to eight months and it was interesting but uh, now i i prefer to to let my actions do the talking well speaking of actions you you say you you connect the boardroom and the tree huggers so what do you mean by that saying uh i think for me the 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 sweet spot has always been and the reason why we started fund life and again this goes back to the reason why maybe i was uh having this comfort the un it's about building bridges it's about creating connection uh, amongst all kinds of people and i think often at the boardroom level, especially at the global political level, they often don't really resonate or connect with those people living at the margins of society, or as, as we refer to the base of the pyramid. And so with Fund Life in my own role, that's really my my main role is to try and create connection, emotional, but also dialogue and empathy between those at the very top who are essentially organizing policy or making decisions to make them understand that these decisions have real consequences for people at the bottom uh, and, and, and climate change is, for example, a very interesting topic where we work because we're in the Philippines. So the Philippines gets hit by about 20 to 30 typhoons every single year. So sometimes when we have these high level discussions about climate change or climate action, these people don't really often understand the consequences on the ground. So it's really my role at some points to try and create that bridge 
between these two often disconnected groups. So you also had some mental health battles, challenges. You overcame manic depression. So kind of tell us about that as, as much as you'd like to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something that uh, I think we still don't do a great job as a as a society all around the world of of sort of discussing, especially for for, for young males. But but like I said to you, I at the beginning, I, I I was sort of growing up with this angst in terms of what I wanted to do, trying to find myself. Um, I knew what I didn't want to do, as I said, which was sort of to spend 30 40 years building a career in something that i wasn't passionate about so i was very i was very sure of that the problem was that i didn't know what i wanted to do and so that caused me a lot of anxiety especially when you had a lot of pressure from from friends from family you know you needed to to get a job you needed to sort of make your own way in the world and so often i the depression was really a cause of I don't want to do something for the rest of my life that doesn't make me happy. And and it sounds so, so sort of simple looking back, but, but it's a real sort of problem. And, And I think for creative people, especially because when you go into the corporate world, it's really a structure where it teaches you to conform. It sort of teaches you that you're not supposed to break the rules you're supposed to just do as you're told, follow your manager, and essentially, um, yeah, try not to try not to stick out. Um, and and so that was something that I wasn't prepared for mentally when when I left university because at, at college you still have this exuberance about life. You still feel that anything is possible. So for me, the mental health issues were really after i graduated and and just sort of understanding the pressures of of life of figuring out how i wanted to dedicate myself and and finding that passion so it's something that's really i guess personal for many people and it's something that's ongoing i mean even even there is no magic formula it's not there is no hack that once you figured it out i think it's just understanding and being comfortable with who you are and even with fund life it's not been an easy journey for the last 10 years it's something that every day it's difficult sometimes especially when you don't necessarily have somebody watching over you and someone that you're accountable to so it's an ongoing process and and running definitely has has helped in an enormous way that I didn't think it would just in terms of creating that meditative state every day, allowing you to really reflect. And uh, yeah, so, so it's something that, um, that is ongoing in terms of sort of it's an everyday challenge, but uh, as you get older and I think as, as people get more comfortable with who they are, then it becomes easier to manage and, and understand the triggers for it. So as fun life, Jess, working in the Philippines or is it worldwide? We've done, so I, I've done consultations for various organizations all around the world. Um, obviously, um, children who are displaced by conflict is something that's close to my heart. So I've done consultations for for NGOs operating in the Middle East, in Syria, in Lebanon. Uh, fund life itself, we're, we're 100% local. So all of the fund life, uh, staff are from the Philippines. They are from the very communities that we support. And this is something that's very important to us, that everything is localized. So uh, as the founder, I'm not active in any of the projects. Uh, my role is more sort of strategic and building partnerships. Um, and yeah, we we typically, in a personal capacity, I typically support organizations from other parts of the world and philanthropists trying to create more social impact. That's that's really my my role, as I mentioned, bridging the gap. So sometimes we work with, or I've worked with uh, high net worth individuals who want to give back, but they're not sure because there's distrust amongst big NGOs. So they're trying to understand how they can augment the impact of their giving. Um, but but fun, 
excuse me, fund life itself, we're one hundred percent concentrated and located in the Philippines, just because that's where we set up. Okay, well, you say that Andrew Tate is a reflection of current leaders, and that Donald Trump is the focus of global distrust. Tell us what you mean by that. Yeah, I think, I think um, our generation. So I'm 37. So I, I, I sort of still grew up uh, before the internet was was a thing, before social media was a thing. But I think the next generation, the the young people today who've grown up with so much access to information, I think they've grown up distrusting power, and um, and I think this is being seen all over Europe. Uh, in in the U.S. also with politics, it's so divisive now. Um, and I think these two very, very charismatic people, uh, you use the example of Andrew Tate and Donald Trump, I think they've just sort of exploited the distrust that young people have and with with power. And I think it's a very dangerous sort of position that we find ourselves in because you've you've seen how how people are wanting change and sometimes that change is not always good you know i'm not here to 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 talk about other people but what i mean to say is that we're in a very precarious position as a as a society just because young people can no longer be lied to in the way that maybe 20 30 years ago certain things could be hidden and um and i think Collectively, we just need to be aware of what is the message that we're sending to young people. You know, what is the kind of future that we want to leave behind? Is it is it this hustle culture where we should be maximizing profit at all expenses, or is it actually safeguarding? You know, making sure that people are growing up and still care about the fabric of society. So I think it's an interesting time where we are as a, as a global species and, and where we're going in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and I think it's just something we have to be aware of, not to be distracted by the by the smaller things, which often we can do in, in a world where we have so many distractions. Tell us about any current or upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about. We have a we have a few. So we just uh, every year we have something for International Women's Month, which is Move for Equity. So that's coming up uh, in March 2024. So if anyone is passionate about uh, gender equity, especially for equal opportunity for women in sports, uh, they can get involved because this is a global campaign. We have activations all around the world. Uh, before that, we're also uh, getting ready for the 10th anniversary of Super Typhoon Haiyan. So this was actually when Fund Life started 10 years ago in, in November 2023 will be the anniversary. And this was the strongest storm to ever hit land. Um, and we're having a big um, activation. Again, we're doing a 10 kilometer run to commemorate uh, the tragedy which happened 10 years ago. Uh, so again, if anyone wants to find out more, feel free to get in contact. But um, these are the two big projects that we're having uh, right now in terms of global activations. And Fund Life has, you know, we we operate uh, across three different um, places in the Philippines, and and we have ongoing programming. So enough to keep us very busy. But those are the two big ones that we're now planning for. Speaking of getting in contact, throw out your contact information so people can keep up with everything that you're up to. Yeah, if anyone uh, wants to find out more, please jump on on our website, which is just fundlife.org. We also have a female-led uh, arm of the organization, which is girlsgotthis.org. Uh, and yeah, you can find us on, on LinkedIn. Um, that's generally the, the easiest way, and, and we're very... We're very easy to contact, so just jump on, send us an email, or uh, find us on Instagram. 
Uh, and we'd love to connect. We'd love to connect with anyone that, that is sort of resonates with anything that we've discussed, especially with sports and giving young people an opportunity to grow. Um, and yeah, just, just if anyone has any questions, happy to, to help and, and hopefully provide some value. I think that's, that's essentially what we want to do with Fund Life. We'll close us up with some final thoughts. Maybe if there was something that I forgot to touch on that you would like to talk about it, just any final thoughts you have for the listeners. Just just to say, I mean, uh, as, as as you mentioned, Curtis, we our work is sort of concentrated in the Philippines. What I would just encourage anyone listening, if you are passionate about something, if you want to give back, um, it's sometimes difficult to to sort of start something by yourself, but just join join a local organization, join a cause that's close to your heart and, and, and get involved by volunteering. That's, that's essentially how, how we started. And a lot of our staff that are with us today started as volunteers. So just if anyone um, has something that they're passionate about, I would just encourage them to, to help out in their local community um, and find someone that they, they admire or someone that they want to help because often that's, that's the easiest way to sort of embark on a on a new and meaningful journey. Ladies and gentlemen, fondlife.org. Please be sure to check out everything that Marco and his um, female companions or female-led arm of the organization are up to. What was that website again for the girls? Girls Got This? The, yes, you got it. Girlsgotthis.org. Okay. Yeah, be sure to check that out. Follow, rate, review, share this episode to as many people as possible. And if you would like to help out, or are people able to donate if they want to help your organization? How can people help out? Yeah, if anyone wants to contribute uh, on the website, we have several uh, donation links. Uh, we work with Global Giving, which is which provides tax free giving for for U.S. citizens and and Australian citizens. So. Please get in touch. Uh, you can you can follow the links on the website. Uh, also, for the girls got this. We have a unique giving page which is supporting female led uh, programming. So yeah, everything is online. Uh, just feel free to browse. And if they have questions, just get in touch. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, like Marco says, get in touch. Also, you can get in touch with me at cjackson102 at cox.net if you have any guests or suggestion topics. As usual, thank you for listening. And Marco, thank you for joining us and sharing your story, talking about fun life. Very happy. Thank you so much for having me, Curtis. Thank you for all that you do and providing this platform. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.